God helped to birth something new 300 years ago that would be a transforming agent in the world. And as we move into this 300th year, our hope is rooted in Jesus the Christ, in the calling to be faithful witnesses of the good news of the gospel. When I think about the 1700s for us, we were viewed as revolutionists. King George was not happy with the Presbyterian presence in the colonies. There was no separation of social witness and politics from their faith. It was embedded into the thread of who they were. That just moves me deeply because out of that mess, a strong faith is born in this nation that would not look like anything that was left behind in England. These first Presbyterians coming into this new land get to know one another and form a church, the first Presbyterian church and the first Presbytery in the New World. This congregation grew out of a group of dissenters who were gathering for worship in the early days of the city of Philadelphia. There is very much an awareness of our long history that is present at all times in this congregation. And that this church was involved not simply in the development of Philadelphia as a city, but in the development of this nation through the participation of members of First Church uh, in the Continental Congress, uh, in the uh, writing of the Declaration of Independence, when you have members who were active in the life of this nation in its founding years, that is something, a heritage, that affects the way we view the church even today and its involvement in the community around us. It's something that we've always seen as our mission. And today we continue to be a faith presence and look at how we can do that in ways that are relevant to our contemporary time and setting. The celebration service continues that and also updates it a little bit. And it did become an intergenerational service. We try to make it where faith is hands-on. It's fun watching these little kids just learn the rhythms of worship, but it also is a service and space that's meaningful for those of us who are adults. So today, when we see needs in our community, uh, going back to the 1980s, when the uh, outbreak of the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic in this community created the need for people to have some help with nutritional deficiencies. So a group of people in this church organized themselves to prepare meals for people who were suffering from HIV AIDS. And our church continues to be involved in supporting the work of MANA, supporting those who may be disenfranchised, supporting the LGBT community. And so from the very beginning, this congregation was part of a community that was inclusive in a way that went far beyond anything that took place in other parts of America. And I think that is still true of the Presbyterian Church today. This thread that continues to go through our historical narrative, it is out of the unwelcome, the unwanted, the enslaved, the tax collector, that a community of faith is born. And I think that's profound. The First African Presbyterian Church is the mother church of African American Presbyterianism in the whole nation. It still is very much uh, alive and well today, uh, but facing new challenges. First African Presbyterian Church was the very first African American congregation in the Presbyterian denomination. This church was a station on the Underground Railroad. Gideon Blackburn the slave owner who happened to be a Presbyterian minister was having a manservant, John Gloucester, and he noticed his gifts for T. 
teaching and preaching amongst the enslaved Africans and then arranged for his emancipation in order to bring him here to Philadelphia because not only is Philadelphia the cradle of liberty, it's also the cradle of religious freedom. John Gloucester was a champion for justice. He was a champion for education. One of the things that the early church did was to begin to educate black folks to read when it was illegal to do so. So how that got established and how we got around the prohibitions was that Bible was being taught so that Sunday school was actually Sunday school. Throughout our history, we've always fought for equality. So from back then um, until now, like we still want to be a beacon here. On Mondays, we have the United Clinics. And they give out free screenings, free referrals, free flu shots, and they do eye testing, blood pressure screening, and stuff like that. So we are out here wanting to support our neighbors and wanting to be that place where you can come and get assistance and help, as well as like a good food and a good sermon. Every possible lack that exists, exists in this community. The Black Male Leadership Initiative is a way that we could address the real uh, tragedy of the school to prison pipeline. This is a way to intervene and cut through that, to have positive role models to see, yes, you can make it. And First African has been intentionally a beacon for a safe zone, for peace, for justice, for education. We find ourselves in a season, in a place and time where once again, we have to meet the challenge of the day. We are the church that now needs to have a bold witness, perhaps even bolder than it's ever been before. That's a challenge, but it's one that we have embraced and have built a nation from, built a denomination from, and that is our challenge moving forward, particularly in this age when we are so balkanized. The most exciting part of today for me is that there is no roadmap. It's kind of like the Exodus Deliverance Church. Now that's scary, right? Because we really don't know where we're going, but we know we have to go. And we know that God is with us. I think it's gonna take a lot of work, right? I think it's gonna call out the same courage that we had 300 years ago and then ties us into the possibility of God's Spirit just unleashing us into the world in new ways.